over to you, Gabby. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to all the, the colleagues uh, from all around the world, hopefully, uh, connecting to this uh, 23rd Knowledge Cafe of the Integrated Policy uh, Practitioners Network, otherwise called uh, IPPN. Uh, I'm David Kudo. I am the Global Human Mobility Advisor at UNDP within the, the Crisis Bureau and uh, I coordinate the work on uh, migration and, and forced displacement. I'm very happy to be, to be here. Uh, just as a quick introduction, IPPN, again, Integrated Policy Practitioners Network, is an initiative of 10 funding UN entities to create community space where we can share lessons and experiences uh, mostly related uh, to the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. The objective is to strengthen collective capacities to apply integrated policy appro approaches in concrete and practical ways. So it's really about practitioners. IPPN is primarily a UN interagency network, though it is also open to colleagues in government, academia, and the broader development community. IPPN is uh, jointly managed by UNDP, UNESCO, UNFPA, UNICEF, ILO, and FAO. And the purpose of this series of monthly knowledge cafes is to showcase insightful experiences of policy integration for accelerating progress on the SDGs. And in this uh, perspective, today's session focuses on leveraging migration for accelerated sustainable development uh, outcomes. So I guess uh, and I am biased, of course, because I work every day on migration, but I think there is not a day where we don't talk in the news about uh, about migration, you don't hear about uh, migration in the news. Um, unfortunately, uh, for the most part, it's very negative and in an oversimplified uh, way. Uh, but for the experts and for the people who have been working on these issues, migration is so much more than what makes the news and feeds polarizing political debates. It's a multifaceted reality with profound social, economic, cultural dimensions. On the whole, and, and historically, uh, the evidence uh, is very clear. Migration has been a force for good, for progress, for development. Looking back, uh, it is on the premise that making migration work for sustainable development, uh, our flagship joint program between IOM and UNDP was developed more than a decade ago. And looking forward, it is the promise, promi promise sorry, that the program has sought to deliver, making migration work for migrants themselves, but also for communities of origin and destination. It has been truly one of a kind of program because of its relative extended duration, because of its innovative approach, which and you will hear about that, uh, focused on mainstreaming migration into broader development considerations and because of its diverse geographic coverage. So today we want to present to you some of our key learnings. Um, so we will start with a brief presentation uh, from IOM we were supposed to have uh, our colleague uh, Cécile Rialan, but she is on a plane right now. Uh, there has been a change, and so we I'm happy to, to receive uh, Daniel Silva, uh, who works on human mobility and sustainable development at IOM, and who will make a presentation on behalf of our two agencies, IOM and UNDP. And then you will hear reflections on the program from Chintan Tamang, who is the mayor of Dankuta municipality in Nepal, uh, Nepal being one of the, the 11 countries that benefited from the joint program implementation. And then we will turn to you all to have an open discussion. So before I pass the floor to, to IOM and namely to, to Daniel for his presentation, our usual note on housekeeping, please make sure that your microphones are muted to allow colleagues to hear the presenters. Uh, do use the chat function to ask questions or share your experiences and insights throughout the session. And after the presenters, we'll open the floor for, for discussion and hopefully for 
uh, active uh, interaction with uh, with all of you. So without further ado, Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you, David, and uh, good afternoon or good morning to you, all of you. Unfortunately, as it was mentioned, uh, Cecile is unable to make it to this meeting due to last minute flight disruption, and she apologizes for her absence, but I'll be doing the presentation that she had prepared uh, for you all. As it was mentioned, uh, my name is Daniel Silva. I'm a policy officer working in Cecile's team at IOM headquarters. That is the team that is focusing on migration and sustainable uh, development. Um, thank you very much, David, for setting the scene for this program, and many thanks also to our friends at the IPPN for hosting uh, this uh, cafe. What we wanted to do in this brief uh, presentation uh, is reflect, as David uh, hinted, on the key lessons learned from a decade of mainstreaming migration into development policies. And, and I'll come to that notion of what we mean by mainstreaming um, uh, in a minute. Um, important to flag that we will not cover every and all elements of learning from this program, as obviously it would take too much time, uh, but to flag that we have those well documented into a final knowledge product that will make sure that it is available to you uh, through this meeting, uh, probably through the chat, you will see links posted to that document and also after the meeting. Um, and uh, therefore we will cover only the sort of the top level and cross-cutting uh, lessons learned. Now, on the concept of mainstreaming, uh, itself, uh, if we go to the next slide, we'll start by that, by looking at what we mean by mainstreaming migration into development and sectoral planning. And to put it simply, it is the process of assessing the implication of migration on any action or goals uh, planned in a development or sectoral strategy. So this is about ensuring that migration-related consideration are identified, are discussed, and are integrated into planning documents such as legislation policies and uh, program. It is about doing so at all levels. So at the local level of governance, at the national level of governance, sometimes where applicable at the regional level uh, of governance understood as between uh, uh, states. Um, and also it is important to do so at all stages of development or sectoral planning, right? So from the design phase, through to implementation and into the phases of monitoring and evaluations uh, of the planning. And why is this necessary? It is necessary because migration is inherently cross-sectoral in nature. Um, we know that uh, uh, mobility uh, uh, cuts across areas and sectors of development. We may know a bit more sorry, depending on sorry, where Daniel. we are from. The, the PowerPoint is not moving. We are still on the front page. So, Connor, if we might be able to put the next slide. All right, I see the slide now. Thanks, David, for, for flagging. Um, so I was saying that while mobility may be known to, to some of you and, and mostly in the, in the public opinion, perhaps more as it relates to remittances on diaspora engagement, in fact, we know that migration interacts with many other topics such as food security, governance, livelihoods, income generation, or education. So integrating mobility consideration into planning and programming across development topics is also vital to the success of those because it advances policy coherence. And when it is done well, then it enables to maximize the positive developmental impact of migration, but also it enables to reduce or mitigate the potential negative effects of migration. And to do so for the migrants themselves, of course, but also for the host communities, for the communities uh, uh, where the migrants settle and for the families of the, the migrant. Um, now, if we go to the next slide, Connor, this is uh, the key outcomes of the program. And this is uh, what we have done exactly for, for more than, than a year now through the various iterations of the program, putting that to practice. Um, and what you see here are the key outcomes represented, right? Um, it is a program that has involved multiple partners, regional, local, national authorities. So this dimension of multi-level that I was mentioning, but also the broad range of partnerships, civil society, support with other UN agencies beyond IOM and uh, UNDP, 
uh, and the private sector across 11 countries that you see represented here on the map, but that you see also that present broadly different development landscape and migration realities as well. Uh, and this will be an element that I'll come back to in, in the learning, uh, in the key lessons learned. But by doing so, by putting this uh, uh, a concept and of mainstreaming to practice, it has changed the lives of more than 15,000 individuals for the better. And we can clearly also identify positive, tangible effects rippling across a range of SDGs and targets well beyond the usual target 10.7 that we associate with well-managed migration. Um, if we go to the next slide, and this will be the main lessons learned that I wanted to share with you today, and we might not go in detail through all, but as I mentioned, uh, uh, more and, and a, a more detailed version of those and more than those is available in the document that we will share. But by mainstreaming, by, by testing uh, the mainstreaming approach in very different context of governance, in settings that present very different uh, development challenges and opportunities, but also that have very different migration trends and realities, uh, be it country mostly of origin of migrants, country of destination migrants, country of transit migrants, or a combination of all of that, countries in which also some displacement they may take place, we have been able to draw some very valuable lessons learned. One of those lessons learned is that there's no one size fits all uh, solution to uh, migration mainstreaming. It must suit the context and it has been evidenced very clearly by working with every 11 different countries. And one could say 11 different processes that were necessary in those 11 countries. Different countries of the program have developed quite unique processes and approach based on their specific context. Some might set up task force around mainstreaming, some might, steer, might set up steering committees, some may go for a specific migration policy or else some may go for uh, a broader approach of mainstreaming migration into different uh, sectors. Another key lesson learned is that flexibility is essential, and this is really a lesson learned of the, 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 the length of the tenure, um, is that my streaming processes must evolve as the migratory context, the politics, the actors, and the need also evolve at the, at the local level. Um, for instance, uh, uh, case in point, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, the program through that phase had to significantly reevaluate its activities, the focus areas and the planned intervention. Uh, and uh, because of the uh, unique effects that the COVID-19 pandemic not only had on the ways of working that we had, but also the effects on human mobility uh, trends in those countries. Um, one interesting point that we uh, want to flag also is that the classic project development cycle approach, uh, which uh, is a bit rigid with predetermined targets and outcomes, somewhat can be a limit also to the innovation and the creativity that can arise as precisely the context changes, the partnerships changes, the opportunities and the momentum also change uh, along the way with its ups and downs. While integrating migration into development policies does offer numerous uh, benefits, it also comes with uh, some challenges. And uh, we had a focus also about being able to identify and understand these challenges um, as crucial to develop the effective solutions that we were uh, aiming to implement with different stakeholders. For instance, and critical, and I think this will resonate probably with a lot of you in the areas that we work in, the necessary building of awareness the building of the buy-in, the building of the relationships, of the trust, uh, and uh, of the agreement that is necessary for that planning to take place and for that ownership to be built. And um, looking back at the 10 years, um, we see the benefit of long-term programming and of phase programming. Uh, long-term programming, which also is a bit um, um, not something that we have to enjoy a lot of time or the capacity to enjoy depending on the fundings that we receive. But for instance, within this program, a whole six months were dedicated at the beginning of the last phase to consultation in each of the country that allowed precisely for the adaptation of the broader goals and outcomes of the program uh, and the fitting of those into uh, a, a, a local or national level of, of uh, needs and a context of work. Um, a lesson learned also through, through that process is that aiming to co be comprehensive is certainly appropriate, 
but we need to understand the limitations that come with that as well. And it is, um, uh, in our case, we saw that it was quite successful of taking the phased approach and prioritizing um, uh, for success. Um, there might be more needs. We cannot attend to all the needs at the same time, but by prioritizing, however, on a specific policy, for instance, in a sector, instead of looking at different sectors at the same time, it might be useful then to build the trust, to build the buy-in, to build the relationships that then enable to go a little bit broader and into different uh, sectors. Point in case, I think this will resonate also with uh, all of you, the, the, that the governance suffers from the changes in, in government um, um, and the changes in the previous administration. Migration is, is perhaps one that is uh, um, most affected by that, given the, the, the heavy politics behind it sometimes. Um, but we need to approach mainstreaming because it takes time, right? And it goes typically beyond one administration. We need to take um, uh, we need to make efforts to institutionalizing those efforts of mainstreaming. Um, the sustainability of the process uh, is fostered when the roles and the responsibilities are also institutionalized through, for instance, legal or technical mandates, uh, through policies and directives, obviously, but also through these policies and directives coming, for instance, with allocated human resources, allocated financial resources. Um, and in relation to that point of institutionalizing, obviously key as well is national and broad ownership uh, is uh, was a key lessons learned in, in this program. We need strong political support, both at the, the, the senior, the more political level, but also at the technical level. And this ensures that there is sufficient then institutional backing to institutionalize also the uh, efforts of mainstreaming. Lastly, uh, for now, um, thanks to this program, we also clearly learned the value uh, of uh, to think top down and bottom up and the value also of earnest, authentic dialogue and listening of the affected communities of civil society and, and other actors. Now, did we um, do? How do we reach scale from this type of programming? And this will be uh, my uh, next slide, which is more on the way forward. Um, the IOM flagship report uh, that was released uh, last year, just ahead of the summit, that looked at how we uh, can leverage human mobility to accelerate uh, and rescue, in a way, the 2030 agenda, um, documented the statistics that you see here on the screen. 65% um, of governments have some provisions for migration governance, but only 4% have comprehensive policies for safe, orderly, and regular migration. We see progress also uh, in that the mainstreaming approach itself is being picked up by a range of stakeholders. Uh, for instance, we had a, a study uh, that was done recently that showed that out of the 56 countries studied, 12 consult regularly migrants in policy planning. Uh, we see also the human mobility and, and the potential of human mobility is increasingly integrated into global sustainable development dialogues. This is true of the SDG summit. Uh, this is true of the HLPFs in, in the last editions of it. Um, and also with the network on migration reporting on the linkages between the GCM, uh, Global Compact on Safe Orderly and Regular Migration, and uh, the 2030 Agenda. But did we reach, without uh, excluding these uh, uh, otherwise optimistic, to some extent, statistics, did we reach the point where we need to be? And the answer is not yet. Um, and because we are not there yet, the potential to use migration, to leverage migration, um, to accelerate sustainable development outcomes remains uh, to some extent uh, untapped. And why are we missing on those opportunities and what do we think needs to be done uh, uh, better going forward? And this will be my last uh, uh, few points that I will make on this presentation. First of all, let's be clear in that business as usual is simply not good enough. Um, we know that none of the, 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 the main challenges that the world uh, experiences today, from the climate crisis to uh, demographic transitions, digitalization, urbanization, and others, none of those can be tackled effectively without considering human mobility. We know also the what the necessary conditions are in terms of 
propitious environment to harness the power of migration. But we can only witness that these solutions are still not at the heart of uh, policy planning and policy making. And when they exist, they are not yet brought to scale and we need to change uh, uh, that. Mainstreaming migration in a way uh, needs to become systematic, almost a reflex we could say. Um, because we know that good migration governance is not about good migration policies at all, given its ramifications that I alluded to uh, in the beginning of, of the presentation. And in practice, what this means, it this means bold commitments at, uh, um, and, and political will and new ways of working that cuts really across society, that cuts across levels of governance um, and with firm engagement of uh, the private sector. Um, we need, uh, on this point of the private sector, to involve, to, to invest in broad multi-stakeholder partnerships so that migration pathways can be transformed into development pathways. And to support that, we need to take a close look also at the funding dimension. Um, public budgeting across levels of governance need to be mobility sensitive so that they accompany the policies through which mainstreaming is implemented. They translate those policies in practice, and we can demonstrate the benefit of putting that to practice. But for that, we need financing. And at a time where public budgets are limited and development funding uh, faces uh, significant constraints that we all know about, it means that we also need new and more ambitious partnerships, for instance, with, with the development uh, banks. So to sum up, we need solutions at scale. We have through this program, a flavor of what needs to be done and a lessons learned about how to do it. We know what works, but we need to bring those solutions uh, at scale. And these solutions, they are upon all of us collectively, well beyond IOM and UNDP, but they are uh, within uh, reach. If we go to just this last slide, I might have been put in the chat in the meanwhile, but if not, feel uh, free and be very welcome to scan also this QR code that will take you also to the uh, lessons learned and the main, let's say, uh, outcome knowledge product. Um, and with that on my side, I will end it here. I will uh, pass the floor now to Mr. Chintan Tanang, um, who is a mayor of a municipality of Nepal, with whom the program has been involved and to get his views and experience in particular uh, from the field. So I thank you on my side. I look forward to a discussion and I will pass the floor to you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good evening and namaste. Distinguished speakers and participants, I am delighted to speak today at this program event. To start, let me introduce you to Tankuta Municipality, one of the oldest municipalities in Nepal's mountainous region. Our municipality is primarily based on agriculture, animal husbandry, tourism, and small enterprises. Many of our Youth migrate to seek better financial opportunities overseas due to limit employment. For prospects at local level, climate change challenges and a lack of physical infrastructure. To address these issues, Dankuta municipality has taken proactive measures to reduce law ways, foreign employment, and promote green growth. We provide counseling to those seeking safe and dignified work abroad. Raise awareness among workers about potential challenges in destination countries, and arrange risk rescue, relief, and compensation for those in distress. Additionally, we focus on reintegrating returning workers into society. Our municipality collaborates with governmental and non-governmental organizations to promote economic, psychosocial, and social reintegration. We offer various skill development and 
entrepreneurship training programs along with grants to create self-employment opportunities, short-term jobs, and support for a small business and the local level. We have also promoted avocado cultivation, earning Dhanguta the title of the capital of avocado in Nepal. To strengthen the local economy and reduce the need for forced migration and to encourage green growth to address climate change impact. A migration is Resources center operates within our municipality, providing counseling service, raising awareness and about potential problems award, and facilitating the rescue and reintegration of these test workers. Dankuta municipality coordinate with intergovernmental mechanism and various stakeholder organization to ensure the center's effective operation. In, partnership, in partnership with organizations such as the International Organization for Migration, IOM, and Ministry of Industry, Commerce, and Supplies, Zankuta, Bhutta municipality has formulated and successfully implemented implement uh, integration reintegration policy for returning migrant workers through the support of the COVID-19 response and recovery fund supported by UN multi partner trust fund and migration for sustainable development program supported by the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. We are proud to be the first municipality in Nepal to achieve this servicing. Yes. Achieve this serving as an effective model for managing foreign employment and reintegration efforts. Our partnership with IOM extend beyond the COVID-19 pandemic together. We have supported capacity building within the municipality in migration and deployment and provide a recovery support to migrant who faced uh, challenges during the pandemic. We are grateful for IOM, IOM's support and support and involving the government, private sector, civil society organization, migrants and local communities. This approach ensures sustained reintegration, capacity development, institutional strengthening, and governments at structural community and individual levels. A key learning point from our engagement is the importance of involving local government and communities at all stages of program planning and implementation to achieve sustained intervention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor, for sharing your experience uh, around this uh, joint program between IOM and, and UNDP. Uh, colleagues, it is now time for, for you to, to intervene, to ask questions, to share experiences. Um, feel free to either write your questions, comments in the chat, or if you want to intervene, we have enough time. Uh, please uh, raise your your hands. Uh, we want to hear from you about uh, what do you think about this uh, this program, these uh, the lessons uh, shared today, and if you have specific questions for for the mayor of uh, of Nepal. Uh, about uh, about uh, the, this experience, 
from the point of view of a country of origin and uh, and it was good to hear about the, the work with return and reintegration but the program was also covering countries of uh, destination issues of uh, integration working with diaspora so it has been a, a very uh, comprehensive uh, program and also we would be we would like to hear about you about uh, your your work your day-to-day -day, uh, responsibilities how you feel, uh, how do you perceive the interactions between migration and sustainable development in practice? Um, what do you do about this? Um, so uh, any any intervention related with uh, your personal work is, uh, is most uh, welcome. So, at the moment, I don't see any. To break the ice, even though I am already uh, speaking. No, uh, I see we have a colleague from uh, from IOM, uh, Prajwal Sharma. So please introduce yourself and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, colleagues. It was wonderful hearing uh, from Daniel, uh, having been part of this program as well. It was delightful to hear like the kind of impact that we were able to uh, make in uh, so many countries. Um, and it was very equally insightful hearing from uh, the respected mayor of uh, Dhankuta municipality. And from our experience, what I can say is like, um, especially the countries that uh, have like frequent changes in the political uh, situation and all, uh, engaging with the local government and local communities especially is uh, very much critical considering like uh, uh, the local government uh, they are usually the stable one considering I mean looking uh, into the federal structures and all uh, comparing with the national level so it makes uh, high impact and also the uh, uh, sustained uh, effort to our, uh, you know, like uh, project activities, if we engage uh, with the local communities and also like pl plan our intervention jointly with the local government. For example, uh, Tanguta uh, municipality was one of the example from this program uh, where we were able to, you know, like um, jointly work with the ward offices, the local unit of the municipality and also the local communities. While uh, the project was focused on the migrant workers, but there were some challenges uh, because uh, which we addressed with together with the respected mayor uh, was like, um, there were other communities who were even in dire situation and required more support, um, especially on the entrepreneurship uh, and then um, support there with their livelihood concern and entrepreneurship. So uh, together with the uh, mayor and his team at the municipality and the local communities um, discussing with them, we also identified key other population that required support and uh, the project was able to support them as well. So as uh, uh, Mr. Mayor uh, rightly highlighted, I think that was one of the learning from previous uh, JMDI component which we uh, try to um, implement through this project. And I think we are uh, it was pretty successful and we are very happy uh, that the initiative uh, from uh, this global program and the, uh, I mean, uh, the um, uh, the big support that we received from uh, the Dhankuta municipality and mayor himself, uh, it was largely success. And we were also supported by the Ministry of Industry, Commerce and Supply. So bringing other component to the um, intervention as well. For example, uh, the uh, good work of uh, UNDP as a, uh, made a program, micro enterprise development programs and other initiatives ongoing at the uh, local level. So the skill component with one in, uh, initiative, um, reintegration support with another initiative. So bringing all these was uh, one of the uh, beauty of this program. So thank you so much. Uh, and we are very delighted to be part of this program. And thank you, especially to the uh, respected mayor for all his leadership and support. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Prajwal, for sharing the, the perspective from, uh, from IOM in, uh, in Nepal and working with uh, the, the mayor. Um, I see another hand, uh, Madhavan Palan. Hello, everyone. This is good meeting you all. Uh, I was just wondering, 
you know, uh, we can have something like AI perspective to all this techno, all this you know non-technical questions because uh, we have to implement at some point, uh, you know, automation in this particular community. Once we uh, and you know reduce the human resources uh, that can go into this particular uh, concepts actually. If we cannot always have a capacity building sort of uh, fundamental and you know uh, and who people to work on this particular community where there's high risk. In uh, just taking care of this, all these particular topics, uh, are we taking, you know, initiatives in, uh, you know, you uh, towards using technology and, you know, using that particular horizontal uh, to leverage us particular, uh, leverage our concepts and, you know, getting to know what we can do and what we cannot do with this particular concept. That would be, you know, something very interesting, uh, you know, to discuss for our, H uh, our, our IPP IPPN community. And second thing is like IOM is uh, in-house community for me, so I, it it is it, it is always pleasure to you know uh, watch and you know have a what to say session report uh, sort of situation in the in 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 our uh, UNDP IP uh, IPPN community. I'm also a UNDP working member, uh, so in Sparkflow, if we can have a technical section, it would be best for me you know to communicate all the ideas that I learned from outside, uh, and you know put uh, all sorts of, you know, prompts like the chat GPT prompts that, you know, that can be helpful for our community actually and make our lives a little bit easier in all this, you know, uh, chaos and all that stuff. Last but not the least, happy HLPF and have fun. Good, good meeting you all. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Manhavan. I think it was interesting to also from the colleagues from IOM and UNDP in Nepal to to hear and, and also the challenges, uh, because usually in these kind of uh, events, uh, we tend to discuss the good practices and uh, uh, the positive lessons. But I think it's very important also to discuss the challenges, because this is what is really useful if we talk about sharing experiences. Um, where we have uh, struggled uh, in the field. So thanks for for sharing that. Uh, I I don't know if there are other colleagues who want to intervene, ask uh, questions. Don't be shy. We still have time. Um, maybe I can uh, revert to Daniel uh, since I was talking about challenges uh, from uh, your experience. Uh, uh, being part of the the management team of this uh, program, what well, what would you say would be the the main challenges you have seen during this uh, this program, or in terms of recommendations uh, about where you have to be careful uh, if you want to overcome big challenges? I, I would actually I would deflate that question, perhaps also in part to some other IOM colleagues that may speak from the perspective of the countries. Um, but I think that uh, the, the point that I wanted to react to on your question is really the, the aspect of enabling a space actually for the program to fail also to some extent, right? Um, we, we, we don't need to pretend that everything is going to work a hundred percent, right? Um, we may start on some policies and then they may uh, drop for the reasons of context that we mentioned, right? There's a turnover in an administration, there's a change in priorities, um, not everything is linear. Um, and this is where also we need to build a space for acknowledging that some things will not come to fruition uh, exactly in the way that uh, uh, we uh, presented it would in theory in an ideal world, in a, in a program document, for instance, or in a, in a concept note. And we need to be able to communicate that also to the donor, right? The donor need to be also on board to understand uh, that, uh, that part of failure, in particular, when as this program, we are in a piloting, which comes then with higher risk, right? But then we need to accept that, that degree of, of risk and we need to make sure that the donor agrees uh, to those. And based ac accounting for the fact that it is a piloting, accounting for the fact that there's a higher degree of risk, then is how we build, we build in uh, as strong as possible uh, uh, um, learning and, and knowledge management mechanism. And um, this is so certainly something that was at the heart of the program, not as the program has ended now, let's look back at the 10 years and let's see what worked and what didn't. But as through the program implementation, through the, 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 the piloting and in a way from, from the get-go of this program, right? How do we uh, assess 
what we get back from the field, the information that we collect, the, the, the push and, and, and the pull are around the, the concept of, the main, of mainstreaming in different contexts, how we use the learnings of what happens in a specific country, given its particular context, to uh, try to do things uh, perhaps differently in another one. So that element that I, I was mentioning in, in the lessons learned also, which is about the flexibility, right? And, and so I'm connecting here a few lessons learned that I mentioned about the flexibility, about the capacity to contextualize um, uh, and, and connecting that with, with a strong uh, knowledge management uh, um, um, effort. Um, and related to that, I want to flag that uh, they will, they're will all um, um, hyperlinked in the document that has been, that perhaps you have uh, scanned or that you have clicked on uh, through the, the, the chat. Um, we have country fishes, um, we have uh, country results level so that you can see what it looks in particular when we speak about specific sectors, right? Because we've not looked at everything everywhere um, uh, in under the broader scope of the program. Um, and also uh, you can see, for instance, more sectoral lessons learned as well. Um, just by looking at the, um, at the table of content, you will see that we have, for instance, lessons about the data. Uh, lessons about uh, cross-cutting elements such as gender-based uh, approaches, but also, as I was mentioning, an unpacking of some lessons learned with engaging with some particular stakeholders, for instance, the, the private sector. Um, but I, I welcome, uh, of course, and not to put them on the spot, but if any of the IOM colleagues um, uh, want to come in on some of the pitfalls, uh, maybe that have they have come across, uh, feel very free to 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 come in. I've seen a few names that uh, uh, might be there from from the country offices. Thanks, Daniel. Indeed, the colleagues are from the other countries, uh, if you want to intervene and share uh, some uh, some experiences from from you. In the meantime, I see that uh, my colleague uh, Serge Capto is. Uh, uh, raising his hand. So, Serge, over to you. Uh, thank you, David. Um, thanks, Daniel and uh, Mr. Mayor, for uh, that very insightful presentation. Uh, I would like to bring the conversation a little bit back to uh, to the SDGs, and particularly for you, Daniel. Um, if you do have a sense from uh, the implementation of the program so far, uh, which are the SDGs that are the most affected by the issue of uh, of migration, and and if possible, if that is a, a positive effect, right? Because we're looking here at uh, how to accelerate progress on the SDGs and how migration can be a factor for SDG acceleration. So, uh, in your sense, uh, where do we see the most benefits uh, when we look at the 2030 agenda? And, and the second question, which could maybe be related to uh, what you just uh, 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 prompted colleagues from other countries, how is this replicable? I mean, now that the program is over, I guess you would be looking at the, some kind of scale. Uh, uh, how would this be? What are the lessons that would make it replicable in other country context uh, that you would see uh, from uh, the lessons you've learned so far. Thank you very much, uh, Serge. If I may take that first one, um, obviously everything that has been done in the context of the program has a strong impact on SDG 10, right? And in particular on, on the target 10.7 uh, that, as I mentioned, is the, the, the prime target when we speak about migration in relations to the SDGs, right? But you rightly point, and, and I mentioned the, the, the rippling effect, the positive effect that by working on well-managed, safe, orderly, and regular migration, we can then have on other sectors because migration is not in isolation, but is inherently connected uh, to social sectors, uh, to governance aspects. Um, uh, um, and to the broader global transformations that we experience, right? Which each creates an effect also on the capacity to advance or the delays, unfortunately, that we are seeing also increasingly, or the slide down, even the reversals on our progress to, uh, towards the SDGs. Now, I will say in, in a general manner, and this is the way we usually present things, is that there's no SDG that you will find that you cannot connect in one way or another to migration. Um, that you look at it from the perspective of, of leave no one behind, or that you look at it from the perspective of uh, ensuring that um, uh, 
we uh, harness the contributions of the migrants in that particular sector. Uh, there's no SDGs where we cannot find one example of those connections, right? And this is something that the 2030 agenda in general recognizes, right? The cross dimensionality, uh, the cross cutting nature of, of migration as related to development. Now, once I've mentioned that, and I've mentioned also that obviously everything that we do has a strong anchoring in 10.7, Depending on what we do then, depending on the type of policies that we look at in particular, it will have a more specific impact uh, on different SDGs. One that is very often uh, coming uh, is um, SDG uh, 8, because we also know that that's a reality of, of international migration, is that the majority of international migrants are, are, are migrants for work uh, purposes, right? So if you happen to be working with that contingent of migrants in their realities through the experiences that they have. Obviously, whatever you will do will have a positive impact on SDG 10.7, but then it will also have quite clearly an impact on, on SDG uh, 8, for instance. But if you work at the community level, if you work on the aspect of, of reintegration, for instance, you will also, in, in those cases, and depending on the context, but I'm, let's say speaking in a general manner, uh, you will um, have uh, a capacity to work, for instance, on on um, on SDG one and no poverty because it's about uh, reducing the poverty and the, the 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 elements of a context that drive people in the first place to move. Right, um, everything that we do and we had a strong. I was mentioning just before the the, the lessons learned on gender based approaches also has a gender dimension, right? So depending on how you do, on what you do and how you do it, you can also uh, uh, advance progress on, uh, on SDG uh, 5. Obviously the aspect of partnership SDG 17 is, is essential and this is um, an, an, an absolute uh, minimal condition to success. Uh, we have heard from uh, Mr. Mayor, we have heard from our colleague uh, Prashwal in, in Nepal as well, um, the work with local authorities, the work with mayors and cities, because for instance, we know that although migration is a global phenomenon and we, it's mostly looked at as a global phenomenon, it is first and foremost, a community reality a, a neighborhood reality. And this is where, therefore, because the impacts are there, because the interactions are there, um, this is where the opportunities and the challenges are. Uh, we know, for instance, that, um, and this is a number, I don't have it uh, specifically, but I remember I have 62% in my head, but it's definitely above 60% of the SDG targets that are directly related to local action, right? So if we connect these different dots, we see also how by working, for instance, in the context of cities on migration, on uh, well-managed migration with local stakeholders, with city stakeholders, we can also then advance progress. And in a context, by the way, where migration is also increasingly urban itself, where displacement also is increasingly uh, uh, urban, we see how, for instance, working through 10.7 on those aspects can also advance progress on uh, SDG uh, 11, for instance. And we could multiply right, uh, the, these type of examples depending on the angle uh, that we take uh, to specific uh, sectors. But to summarize and briefly to, to your question, SDG 10, of course, SDG 8, SDG 1, um, uh, are those that, and SDG 17 are those that we associate the most frequently with migration, but it doesn't mean that other SDGs are not positively impacted by uh, migration potentially, or also that um, not uh, um, reaching well-managed migration will not negatively impact also progress in a way on those SDGs, right? So we need to look at it from the two perspectives. Progress on each SDGs, um, is hampered also to some extent if we don't reach that level of safe, orderly, and regular migration that we want. Um, but in, the, in turn, also, and this is from the other perspective, safe, orderly, and regular migration can advance progress on those uh, SDGs and even not only advance, but accelerate progress on these different SDGs. Over. Thanks, uh, Daniel, for responding to that. 
uh, I think it's uh, it's key and, uh, and and the role that migrants play. I mean, we have the case of COVID and on SDG on health. So many uh, migrants uh, were in the uh, working in the health uh, sector and helping uh, countries face the consequences of uh, of COVID nineteen. Um, I I. We still haven't heard so much about other experiences. I see we have colleagues from Moldova, for instance. Uh, I, I don't know if uh, you, you want to share a little bit of uh, the experience in, in Moldova, knowing that uh, this is a country with uh, high levels of uh, emigration. Um, nope. Vitaly from... Hi, uh, hi, hello, colleagues. Yes, indeed. Thanks a lot, uh, David, for... Great. giving the floor. Indeed, Moldova was traditionally was a part of the program uh, from its inception and during the decade of the implementation, a lot have changed, but as well the program itself uh, supporting the, the mainstreaming work or how we call it the whole of the government approach. And uh, indeed this led to the consistent improvement of the country's migration management uh, work. But what I'd, I'd like maybe to, to echo and maybe to give some uh, some advice for other maybe countries who'd like to to to, pers to, um, to continue this work or to replicate uh, this model in their own country. We, during our project implementation, we have identified some lessons learned, uh, but also some, um, sequence of activities that might you know uh, be useful for replicating so first i would say that investing initially in evidence gathering which would provide the initial situation and analytical overview to adopt the migration mainstreaming approach in a certain country so in moldova we implemented diaspora mapping extended migration profile study, profiling of labor migrants vulnerabilities, and we tried to pilot test this instrument and to integrate this uh, instrument in the, the existing national authority setup. So to serve and to enhance the data, data based on migration and develop, development. Then it is important, I think, to identify champions in the in the decision making bodies who would like to uh, pilot test and then institutionalize this uh, this um, this uh, models these tools so we, uh, within the for example within the presidential office or prime minister's office or, or otherwise in other institutions responsible for setting the strategic development agenda of the country so it is important to identify arguments to the convince the officials uh, and these bodies of their self-interest to, to respective agency officials and the importance and the linkages between migration and, and development. At, at the next step, I think the next st stage would be to create an, an, a core working group of high level officials, which will be working to define this shared strategic vision. So the shared strategic vision on how to benefit and how to valorize the migration potential to development is very, very important. And uh, this, of course, would need to be uh, implemented and um, let's say pilot tested together with the UN partners. So we partnered in this endeavor, of course, with UNDP, but then with ILO, with UNICEF on different uh, strategic activities together to to uh, to promote this shared vision and and, and ensure the buy-in and ownership of the go government because this is important even to develop a roadmap and a clear plan towards the towards, to the towards the the creation of the structures and mechanism for mainstreaming of migration in Moldova this uh, uh, this provided good results and now we have a diaspora strategy, engagement strategy. We have an interinstitutional mechanism on, on migration and development, both on the central and, and local level. So this is why it's important to formalize the establishment of the structures and mechanism 
for mainstreaming of migration and no, not only to institutionalize and formalize, but also to ensure this multi-stakeholder participation. Uh, last development was the, the engagement with the Ministry of Environment because uh, till recently the migration and climate change nexus was not uh, understood and was not approached. And, but now, for example, the Ministry of Environment is kind of champion in promoting the mainstreaming of migration and climate change uh, issues. And um, working as mentioned above uh, with, with decision-making bodies and identifying champions in this regard is very important. And then at the next steps, one I think needs to equip the newly devel developed structures or mechanisms with the, with the analytical and maybe policy and monitoring tools and the tools which gather data, which I mentioned above, migration profile, uh, exposed policy evaluation guides, and maybe in Moldova, we, we also develop a checklist on application of the mainstreaming in different policy helped to monitor and evaluate how the, the mainstreaming mechanism is implemented both on central and the local level. And maybe a last issue, I think it's important to expand uh, the mainstreaming mechanism to the local level. So in Moldova, we started the mainstreaming work on the central level, but the results was indeed uh, impressive and uh, it also contributed to the de development, not only for the policies, but for the programs to support the diaspora engagement. So for example, the PARE 1 plus 3 plus 1 uh, program was uh, pilot tested and implemented, which is supporting the, the investment of remittances in uh, economic development. Then on the local level, this was complemented and uh, with the, another program, DAR 1 plus 3, which is supporting the invest investment from the diaspora communities into the, from the diaspora association into the local communities. And this is kind of um, uh, mainstreaming on the local level. And this endeavor ensures vertical policy coherence and whole of society of, uh, effort as well. So this is uh, very briefly some of our advice and consideration for the replication of the such mechanisms in other countries. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Vitaly, uh, for sharing the experience of Moldova. We only have uh, three minutes left. Uh, Daniel, in uh, a couple of additional things you want to say in uh, two minutes, uh, especially I think it would be good to hear about countries, uh, colleagues interested in uh, working on mainstreaming migration into development uh, planning, uh, the resources uh, after 12 years of working on uh, on these, uh, what uh, trainings, uh, toolkits, technical support that uh, they can uh, tap uh, into. Thanks very much, David. And very briefly, uh, to thank all the, the 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 persons that came in and intervened and had some questions. Um, on the resources, you will see as it relates to the program that there's um, um, an, an annex with a number of resources already. Those are more focused on the program and the specifics of the program, um, but also from the country's perspective. Um, then uh, we have a number of resources beyond that that are more about the how of mainstreaming and that may uh, that are tailored to different audiences. Uh, if you are a mayor, if you are working for UN agency, if you are uh, uh, working with a ministry at the national level, you will find at IOM different resources. We don't have the time to develop those at the moment, but what I can do perhaps is that I will type my contact in the chat and feel free to, to reach out and so that we make sure that if you want to just dive in a little bit more about the, on the concept of mainstreaming in the perspective that interests you most, you can find uh, the resources that um, is uh, fit for that, be it a training, be it a guidance, be it some uh, uh, other tools, or sometimes just out of the sharing of, of the practices. Um, so I will uh, put my contact in, in the chat and uh, 
in my closing, uh, thank you to all of the participants. And again, thank you to the IPP and uh, colleagues and, and to you, David, for the moderation. Thanks, uh, Daniel, and thanks to, to the mayor who had to, to leave. Uh, just to say that it was a great example of uh, interagency collaboration, 12 years of uh, fruitfully uh, working uh, together. So that was amazing. Thanks, colleagues, for the also the fruitful and quite uh, interactive uh, discussion, even though we're already uh, in the middle of summer. Um, I, I now invite you to join the IPPN uh, network to continue this conversation. Uh, you should be able to, to access the presentations, the recording of today's session, and uh, any other relevant uh, resources on the IPPN uh, platform through the link uh, that has been posted in, uh, in the chat. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again in September to continue exploring together how to advance the practice of policy integration for the 2030 Agenda. I wish you a good rest of uh, the day, afternoon, evening, and uh, hopefully uh, many of you will also have a, a great uh, summer holiday. So bye-bye, uh, colleagues. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.